Halleluja. 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 We give God all the glory, all the praises, all the honor. Indeed, his name is excellent above all. Yes. May his name forever remain glorified. Amen. Today's two Bible lessons, book of Isaiah chapter 42 from verse 5, and Acts chapter 17 from verses 15, 16, and down. I read these two chapters over and over again and got so many different messages and we'll start and we'll stop and we'll delete and we'll cancel. But the Lord drew my attention, finally, to verse 16 of Isaiah 42. I will lead the blind. It says I will bring the blind. By ways they have not known. By a way they have not known. Along a familiar path. I will lead them in a path that they have not known. I will guide them. I will guide them. I will turn the darkness into light before them. It says I will make darkness light before them. And make the rough places smooth. And I will make the rough places smooth. These are the things I will do. It says these are the things I will do for them. I will not forsake them. And not forsake them. Thank you. When I read that, you know, even when they were reading it, some people said amen. And I said to myself, I'm not blind. Why is God, you know, being special to blind people? How about the people that are not blind? Why wouldn't God make our own crooked path straight as well? Why is it just, you know, the blind people? And the second lesson in Acts 17, from verse 26, and hath made of one blood. It says, and hath made of one blood. All nations of men. All nations of men. For to dwell on all the face of the earth. To dwell on the face of the earth. And hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. It says, God has determined, even before we were born, our bounds, the times, our limits, everything concerning us. Continue. That they should seek the Lord. It says that they should seek the Lord. If happily they might feel after him. It says if happily they might feel after him. And find him. And find him. Though he be not far from the, every one of us. Thank you. Though he be not far from every one of us. It says so that they should seek the Lord. The New King James it says in the hope that they might grope for him. That said in the hope that they may feel for him. Why are you, who, who, who are the people that grope for stuff? Blind the blind people, blind. right? Right, you, you're, you're feeling for things because you don't know what's around you. So the message of today is about how we have to be blind in order to follow God. Your declaration of blindness and this worship and this service of God is your act of total surrender unto God. I'm not talking about, you know, physical blindness and you put a blindfold around your face. But when you walk with God and you identify yourself and say, Lord, I am completely blind. And I am completely reliant on you. It's you essentially saying, God, I can go nowhere, I can do nothing, I can make no moves without you. And then God holds your hand and he leads you, right? You've seen blind people before that are led by others. They go wherever the person leading them to goes. Do they have a choice but to trust that person, right? They don't know if the person is leading them into fire. They don't know if the person is leading them into the middle of the road. They just have to trust that that person is going to lead them where they need to go. A lifestyle of blindness when you're walking with God also helps you live a life of righteousness. Because if you think about it, let's deal with the righteous aspect first. It's hard to be, you know, one of the things that God hates, pride. It's hard to be proud. 
if you're blunt. You know, do you want to be, do you want to boast about how good you look? You don't know how you look. Do you want to boast about how much money you have? It's kind of hard to know how much money you have if you're blinded to those things. Blindness is you telling God that I am denying self completely and I am just looking onto you. You have essentially said, I have made that decision to be completely humble. What did Nebuchadnezzar say when he stood on the balcony? Look at what my hands have made. We know what happened to him. God made him into a beast. Said, this is what your hands have made. Right? In the book of Acts, it said God made all things and everything that is in this earth. And he's standing there saying, look at what my hands have done. The same thing with the rich man in the New Testament. He said, wow, look at all these things I've built up for myself. I'll break up the barns and build even bigger things. God said, you fool, your life will be required of you tonight. So when you tell the Lord that I'm ready to walk in blindness with you, you're saying that I'm ready to live a life of humility. I'm not looking at how big I am. I'm not looking at how beautiful or how handsome I am. I'm not looking at how much money I am. I'm not looking at how whatever I am towards anyone else. Because I'm not looking at me. I'm only trusting this person that is holding my hands. When you're blind, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to find fault in others. It's kind of hard to see the shortcomings of others. The woman that was caught in the act of adultery, what happened? They pulled her out and everybody picked up a stone. I'm sure there were a few people that were there that didn't even see her. They just heard, oh, we found some computer. They picked up a stone, ready to stone her. Because they saw her. They, they saw that she was a sinner. But Christ came and said, He that has no sin, let him cast the first stone. Christ looked beyond the obvious of her sins and of our shortcomings. He said, Woman, stand up, go and sin no more. But we as humans, we're so quick to find faults in others. We're so quick to see how this one did this, and how this one dressed like this, and how this one talked to this one. We're so quick to judge others. When God says, remove the plank, that is your own eye first, before you remove the tiny, the tiny speck, that is your neighbor's eye. How can you even see what's in your neighbor's eye if you've chosen to walk in blindness? So the message is, stop looking at what's wrong with the world. Stop looking at what's negative about everybody else. And you just focus on your walk with God. If you see someone doing anything wrong, it's for you to pray for them, not for you to condemn them. That's God's job. When you're blind, it's hard to revenge against those who wrong you, right? How do you know who stepped on you? How do you know who stole from you? How would you know who offended you? Right? God says, vengeance is mine. But we're so quick to say, oh, I'll never forgive. I'll never, I'll make sure I pay them back. I'll make sure I do this. What did Christ say when they were doing all those things against them? He said, Father, forgive them, for they do know what they do. Right? Christianity is for us to emulate Christ. So when someone wrongs you, when someone does something negative to you, it's not for you to condemn, it's not for you to curse, it's not for you to plan how you're going to revenge against them or your children or your family. Just pray for them and let God take care of them. The time is far spent. And we keep hearing sermons over and over and over again. But we need to make the conscious effort to begin to change. How can you see the mountain that's before you when you're blind? Right? Everyone is going through their issues and their problems. How can you see this big problem that is before you if you're blind? 
we fear when we see the problems that stand before us, right? Perfect story, David and Goliath. Before David got there, what was Goliath doing? He was standing there challenging everyone. And what were the Israelites, Saul, what were they all doing? They were hiding because they were looking at the size of the problem and no one went forward. But David came with that spirit of blindness. He didn't say, oh, I know Taekwondo, I'm going to beat this guy up. Right? He came in the strength of his guide and said, the God of Israel that I serve will bring you down today. But a lot of us, we say we trust God, we say we serve God, yet we see Goliath in front of us. All of a sudden, we're now coming to church, we don't know how to pray anymore, we start getting scared. We need to learn how to not be like the Israelites and be like David and not look with our physical sight at the size of the problems in front of us. Be blind to it and open your eyes to the guide that is holding you. I mean, I, God said, I created everything. That mountain that's before you, God has a hand in it. The Bible said he created everything, everything. Was it not the Bible in 1 Samuel that says God sealed up the womb of Hannah? Yes. Was that not her mountain? But she continued to go to Shiloh every year. Even when she was provoked by the man of God. I said, woman, are you drunk? Are you drunk? Murmuring like that? She had every opportunity to react, right? Because someone just, quote unquote, wanted to offend her. She had every opportunity to say something negative, but she was blinded and said, my Lord, no, I am just a woman of sorrowful spirit. And the man of God prayed for her. And what was a huge mountain before her, God removed it. So what is that mountain that is before you, that is making you cower, that is making you scared? Stop looking at it. We're all here because we believe in God. We're all here because we are here to worship God. We're all here because we, we, we want to serve this God. If you truly understand the power the magnitude of this God you serve. You'll be hard pressed to ever be afraid of the problems that are before you. But we're so quick to lose sight of God and allow the size of our problems to wear us down. I'm talking about an attitude of blindness. And you have to trust. That's the most important thing. You have to trust the person that is leading you. It will be a completely unsuccessful journey if you continue to, oh, where am I going? Oh, the floor I'm stepping on is kind of, you just have to let go and trust that God knows what he's doing. I mean, you, you, can, you, you, you put the stuff in the GPS and you trust it that it's gonna get you to where you're going. Where that GPS is taking you is God that made that way. So if the GPS tells you to go right and God tells you to go left, as humans, we want to trust the GPS more. But God created the heavens, the earth, and everything that is in it. We need to start learning to trust this God that we claim that we're serving. The book of Isaiah 31, from verse 1, Woe to them that go down to Egypt. He says, Woe to those who go down to Egypt. Woe to go down to Egypt for help. For help. And stay on horses. And rely on horses. And trust in chariots. It says, Woe to those who trust in chariots. Because there are many. Because there are many. And in horsemen. And in horsemen. Because they are very strong. You are trusting in your strength. You are trusting in your degrees. You're trusting in all the letters after your name. You're trusting in your bank accounts. You're trusting in those things that you can physically see. Those things that make sense. You're trusting in the help of man. You're trusting in all other avenues. 
Continue. But they look not unto the Holy One of Israel. He says, but they look not unto the Holy One of Israel. Neither seek the Lord. Neither seek the Lord. You have not sought the Lord. You have not sought the face of the Lord. And brethren, what it means to seek the Lord. If you read it anywhere in the Bible, there is nowhere that it says, seek the Lord for dash, dash, dash. There is no duration of time that it plays after seeking the Lord. But we as humans, we have placed a time after that. You seek the face of the Lord. You will seek the favor of the Lord for two years, three years, four years, five years, six, seven, eight. No job, no child, no baby, no spouse. Enough is enough. Time to start trusting and other things. Once you've made the decision to seek the Lord, you've made the decision to go with God and God alone. There is no time limit to how long you must wait to hear from God. There is no time limit for how long you must wait to receive from God. You just must continue to seek His face. And as it says, He's already created bounds. God already has a timetable for when He's going to do what He's going to do in your life. You may not know it. I may not know it. But if you truly trust this God, you just have to trust that He's going to do what He said He's going to do. When He says He's going to do. Continue. Yet. It says yet. He also is wise. <laughs> it says God also is wise. Because it says you're only seeking him when it's convenient for you. But it says God also is wise. I will bring evil. It says it will bring evil. I will not call back his words. I will not call back his words. But will arise against the house of the evildoers and against the help of them that work iniquity. Continue. Now the Egyptians are men. It says the Egyptians are men. And not God. They're not God. All these things that you are seeking help from, they are not God. All these things you are relying on, they are not God. Continue. And their horses' flesh mm -hmm. are not spirits. They're not spirits. When the Lord shall when the Lord shall stretch out his hand, both he that helpeth shall fall. And he that is hoping shall fall down. It shall not be a portion in Jesus' name. Amen. And so those that are helping together. and those that are seeking out from go to life at you because they're all going to fall. You cannot ever at any point in time turn your back on God. God doesn't need your help. He just wants you to trust Him. Don't have a conversation with your wife and say perhaps what God meant was this baby may come through our housemaid because we've been waiting for so long and this thing hasn't happened. So you start using your intellect. Maybe what God meant was the way I'll get this money is through this illegal means. Maybe what God meant was this whole medical thing. I don't know how many prophecies I've got about it. After a while of not getting to where I wanted to go, I started saying, well, I mean, there are other jobs where you can also help people. So maybe what God meant was that my career would be down this path of helping others. Because when you wait so long, your mind just begins to wonder. Maybe, what well, no, God meant what he meant. Just hold on. Keep trusting. Keep waiting. We all hate that word, waiting, 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 waiting. But what are you going to do? Okay. You're not going to wait. What are you going to do? Right? You're waiting for a baby. You're 51. What are you going to do? <laughs> Somebody said I don't. <laughs> right? Trust God. There's a reason God is doing what He's doing. But the, the funny thing about trusting God is in Psalm 9, verse 10, Psalm chapter 9, from verse and 10. And they that know thy name, it says, though that know thy name, will put their trust in thee. For will put their trust in you. For thou, Lord, has not forsaken them that seek thee. Thank you. It says, those that know your name will put their trust in you. For you have not forsaken those who seek you. Paul was walking around and he said, 
You people are very, very religious. Very religious people. But I saw one uh, statue in front of your church with an inscription that says what? To the unknown God. A lot of us are serving an unknown God. And it is impossible to trust someone you don't know. That's why it says here, those who know your name will put their trust in you. Right? We all feel like we know this God that we're serving, but do you really know the God you're serving? Because you, you may think that it's okay to use your mouth to condemn your fellow brethren. You may think that it's okay to use the same lips to destroy others. And then come to church and use that same mouth and start singing praises to this God that you think you know. You really think God is sitting there receiving your praises from your lips? This God that you claim that you know. The same hands you used to defraud others, the same hands you used to destroy the homes of others. You now come to church and start leaving those hands, saying you're praising, you're worshiping God. And you think God too is sitting there receiving your praises. You're dancing with your tray of thanks off and saying you're praising God. Yet your heart is filled with hatred and malice against the person that is dancing next to you. And you think that you 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 you, you think God is standing there there to receive your offering. And you claim that you know God. If you truly know this God, this God that is created the heavens, it says he stretched it out mm. with his hands. Mm. So he created it, I know. <laughs> he stretched it. Just think about that. That's the God that you're serving. The same God that made Satan. Is the God that you're serving. So if you truly claim that you know him, what are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? Because you know that God is, we all say it, God is able to do all things and he's able to supply all my needs and he's able to do this. That, that, if that's truly the God you know, why don't you act like you're serving this God that you know is capable of doing all things? God looks at our hearts. And God is looking at each and every one of our hearts today. Trying to see where we truly stand with Him. You know, people always say, it's easier said than done. You don't know the problems I'm going through. You don't. Everyone has got their cross. Everyone has got their own problems. last verse of the, the, the second lesson says, the time of ignorance has passed. So it's God, 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 God has had enough. From the most obvious to the most little things, God has had enough. You either trust God or you don't trust God. You either have faith in Him or you don't have faith in Him. But you have to be blind. It's not a, a, a you know, you're, you're, you're trying to peek to see where, just completely an utter surrender to Christ. There's no two ways about it. Because the, the word in, in Isaiah, God says, I will not forsake those people, the blind ones. I will never forsake them. Simply because they have chosen to completely depend on me. In everything you do, in everything you do. And the book of Acts says, he's, he's, he's near. He's close to each and every one of us. God is not far. God is not far from you. He's not far from me. He's near to each and every one of us. But we need to take our focus on all of those things that desire to draw us away from God. We need to take our focus off of our problems. We need to take our focus off of all those things that bring tears to our eyes. And begin to delight ourselves in God. I love how David said, it says, I delight myself in the Lord. And the thing is, when, when, when God is your delight, when things go wrong in your life, 
You may be sad for a moment, but because you delight in this God that never changes, your heart is always going to be filled with joy because you know whatever you're going through, God is in control. Amen. Right? Yeah. Romans 8, 28, all things work together for the good of those who love God. For those who have chosen to be blind, for those who have chosen to be completely dependent on God, all things work together for their good. So no matter how bad your situation is, you're like, God, I delight in you. Because I know whatever I'm going through right now is working together for my good. Amen. Amen. God will never forsake you. Amen. God will never forsake us. Amen. The book of Mark, chapter 10. You can read from verse 49. Jesus stood still. Jesus stood still. And commanded him to be called. And commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him. We all know this story. Jesus was passing. A lot of rock was going on. The blind man was screaming, shouting. The disciples told him to quiet down. But he kept on shouting. Because when you've chosen to declare blindness, you're looking for someone to guide you. So this man wanted Christ to be his guide. He began to shout, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. In that crowd, in that multitude, as loud as it was, Jesus heard the voice of the blind man. It says Jesus stopped and said what? Continue. They called the blind man, saying unto him, Saying unto him, Be of good comfort. Be ye of good comfort. Rise, he calleth thee. <laughs> it says, Okay, enough, enough, he has heard you. Rise, he calleth thee. The man didn't know where Jesus was. So and the people, the disciples, had to guide him to Christ. Continue. And he, Casting away his garment. He cast away his garment. Rose and came to Jesus. He was so happy. He was so excited. He tore his clothes. He ran. And he went to meet Jesus. Continue. And Jesus answered and said unto him. Jesus answered and said to him. What will thou that I shall do unto thee? Says the blind man. He's groping. He's like, where is this Jesus? And Jesus said unto him. What can I do for you? The blind man said unto him. The blind man said unto him. Lord. Lord. That I might receive my sight. That I may receive my sight. Continue. And Jesus said unto him. And Jesus said unto him. Go thy way. Go thy way. Thy faith has made thee whole. Your faith has made you whole. And immediately he received his sight. Mm -hmm. And followed Jesus in the way. And immediately he received his sight. And did what? And followed Jesus. He followed Jesus. Because as you continue, once you've made this declaration and you say, God, I'm totally dependent on you, you wake up, it's prayer. Before you eat, it's prayer. Before you start your car, it's prayer. Before you do something, it's prayer. You're constantly praying. Before you do your project at work, it's prayer. You're praying so often that even God is like, ah, don't you have anything better to do? Because the thing is, when you're completely reliant on God, you're constantly communicating with Him. You're constantly seeking Him. You're constantly, it's not, it's not always a kneeling down in the corner and praying. But once you're constantly having dialogue with God, Lord, I commit this spreadsheet into your hands. Simple prayer. Lord, I commit this conversation I'm about to have with my boss into your hands. Constantly talking to him so that God is like, this person is truly, truly dependent on him. God, I don't know why I'm sad today. I'm just having a bad day. Please help me. Please cheer me up. God becomes the source of everything that you do. Once God sees that and you get to that level, God now opens your eyes. But he opens it so that you begin to see things his way. That's why he says, after the blind man, how many blind people did God heal? The one that he spat in the sand and put on his face, to God heal them, he ran to the church to go and tell the world what he had done. 
Since this one stood and he followed Jesus, a time will come when God will now open your eyes so that everything you do going forward is all in line with Christ. Amen. Everything. And I love that verse 14 of Isaiah 42. It says, I have held my peace for a long time. I have sat still and I have restrained myself. It says, now I will cry out like a woman in labor. I will pant and gasp at once. And I will lay waste all the mountains and all the hills. For those who walk with Christ, for those who depend on Christ, God says, I have held my peace for a while. Sometimes God holds his peace when you're going through your struggle, when you're going through your hardship. The time when you want to hear God the most is the time God is the most silent, believe it or not. When you are at your lowest of lows and you're about to give up, that's when God will now turn the other way because he's waiting to see what you're going to do. Father, Father, why have thou forsaken me? Is there a verse in there that said, God said, I have not forsaken you? Do we, do we hear anything about God's response to when Christ was on the cross? God did not say a single word. Are you going to give in and say, God, I can't take this anymore? What are you going to do when God doesn't speak and when God holds his peace? For those who continue to hold on to God, for those who continue to say the Lord gives and the Lord takes, blessed be his name. Amen. God said, I've held my peace enough. I will now arise and clear all those mountains that are before you. I will now arise and begin to make your path straight. I will now arise because God is angry. God feels for you. God wants to help you. He wants to come and make your path straight. But the devil is also sitting there saying, this person will turn their back on you. So you will wait until your lowest of lows. How many, what, 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 when did Job lose everything? Chapter, what is it, chapter 1 or chapter 2? When God and the devil had the conversation and Job lost all his children, lost all his property. When did God speak? Chapter 38. Job was suffering. He had sores on his body. Everyone died. He lost everything. And God did not say a single word. God did not say a single word. But God wanted to speak. God wanted to speak. And after he corrected Job, God said, I've held my peace long enough. Job, I'll restore you double for everything you have lost. Brethren in the Lord, don't lose your faith in God. Don't lose your confidence in God. Don't lose your trust in God. God said the time has come, and the time is now. The end of Acts, it says, that time of judgment will come, and it's calling every one of us to repent. When you choose to live a life of blindness, and you're completely reliant on God, God will lead you. God will direct you. Amen. God will make your path straight. Amen. Don't let simple vices make you lose your crown of salvation. Don't let because somebody didn't forgive you make you lose your reward. These things are worthless. They're completely worthless. This uh, I saw an eight-year-old boy in the uh, emergency room. The uh, ambulance brought him in because he had been hit by a car. He was skateboarding, hit by a car. The boy really, he couldn't walk, but he was awake. He had bruises all over his body. And I don't ask him what happened. I said I was skateboarding and out of nowhere, this car came and struck me. And he said, I don't know what happened, but I felt like somebody came and carried me and placed me gently on the floor. I said, when I looked up, the person looked like grandpa. 
because his grandfather had died a few years before. When you live a life of total trust in God, you may get hit by a car. You may get tossed in the air. But Grandpa is going to come and carry you and place you gently on the ground. But you have to trust God. I didn't say it was going to be easy. I didn't say it was going to be a walk in the park. But God will get you through it. And God bless His holy words. Amen.